good morning and um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this lecture series is sponsored by the Texas Water and Energy Institute at the University of Texas, Pemi and Basin. First of all, um, I would like to recognize that um, this global pandemic that we are going through, um, I hope that you and your family are staying safe. Our prayer is that um, this will be over soon and uh, we'll be able to meet in person. Uh, today's lecture is very important. I am very grateful uh, for the speaker. Uh, the topic is uh, short treatment trends for produced water reclamation and reuse. Mm -hmm. uh, professor Tahi Kat is a professor of uh, civil engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. I said earlier that I'm very grateful because he is well accomplished and um, this topic is very important. Similar to the previous presenters like uh, Bridges Calon or Josh from uh, Wara Intelligence, this, the focus of this talk is to provide us some insight on uh, wastewater treatment uh, desalination. Uh, processes and uh, Professor Kat is an international authority in this field and um, I will not go through his uh, resume but he is the director of the Advanced Water Technology Center, co-director of the Colorado Center for Sustainable uh, which is called West and he holds a joint appointment at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. NREL. With this, I turn it over to Professor Kat. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nanu, and uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. And, and again, I, I feel sorry that we cannot do it, uh, you know, face to face in person <coughs> to the, <coughs> to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, but I, I promise that I will uh, come and visit you. Uh, you. Let me start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Excellent. Um, good. So, um, you know, again, I had the pleasure in the last uh, 50, uh, 30 minutes to talk to Professor Nanu and and to find out actually that he is also, uh, you know, a, a accomplished uh, research in, in the water field. So, so that's that's a great uh, thing to know, and um, and my presentation today will be about water, um, and and again, Sarah, if my if if uh, if if there's any problem with uh, with my screen, let me know, uh, and I'll, um, hopefully the, our connection will be uh, good throughout the presentation. So yes, uh, I, I've been with the Colorado School of Mines for. Um, um, for for 15 years, Colorado School of Mines is just west of uh, Denver at the uh, foothills of the Rockies. Um, and, uh, and uniquely enough, Colorado School of Mines is uh, approximately the size of uh, of your university, the University of Texas in uh, Permian Basin, around 7,000 students with, I think, the same ratio of undergraduate and graduate students. Um, uniquely enough, uh, Colorado School of Mines was was started. It was the first university in Colorado and uh, started uh, the research and, and education in the area of uh, different industries. Uh, of course, uh, mining industry, but also petroleum industry and others. And water was always one of the um, important topics. So uh, we ended up that we currently have six centers on campus dealing with water. Uh, and Professor Nanu uh, mentioned Aquatech that I started when I joined School of Mines 14 years ago, and in West, it is a, a center uh, for the you know, water, energy, education, science, and technology uh, that was funded the, with support from Conoco Phillips. But uh, we have a, a, a Renew It, which is a NSF uh, engineering research center, 
in the uh, um, uh, groundwater um, um, modeling center in CSEP, which is a uh, is a very interesting center for contaminant transport in in the subsurface. Um, and, and Sarah, which focuses on on uh, analytics in 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 water and wastewater. Uh, so we are really uh, focused on on, uh, on on water as, as a major uh, uh, field. But today I'll talk about oil and gas uh, research and, and how we develop technologies and approaches to uh, to help the industry be more sustainable and more environmentally uh, um, uh, oriented. Uh, and I really like this uh, um, uh, diagram from EWI that shows some some aspect of the life cycle of water in the oil and gas industry. You know, it's it's very intense, but but you can see here uh, there's you know treatment and storage and and use and reuse and and use for different things, which uh, tell us that the oil and gas industry you know is an oil and gas industry, but they are also water industry. So. They have a lot of things related to water that they need to deal with, um, and anything that we can do to to optimize their use of water uh, will help um, you know everybody. Because at the end of the day, we all are user you know users of energy. So I'll, I'll, I'll specifically focus on produce water. And I think you know most of you know that uh, this is a really complex uh, water that have uh, many constituents of many groups, and within these groups at very high concentration. So we have oils and grease and solids and and dissolved constituents which can be inorganic and organic, uh, and they are most of them at very high concentration. And you, you probably know from your region that they are. Um, you know, you know, some of them can be more than three times the concentration of seawater. Uh, we can we have many metals that are by themselves can be uh, problematic, but uh, you know, some of them uh, we know pose many problems to treatment processes. So removing them is is uh, you know is is of great importance. Uh, and we have dissolved gases, you know, hydrogen sulfate is one of them, but many of these, you know, volatile organics that come with it and, 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 and radionuclides. So a lot of things that we need to remove. Uh, and, and those of you who are familiar with water treatment processes know that you have to fit different technology to remove different constituents. So, you know, the main, the main challenges, oops, I clicked on a wrong button here. Okay, um, so the major challenges are, are the fact that uh, we have highly variable uh, wastewater quality changes with time and with location. Um, very water variable water quantity. We have some basin that don't have enough water and they need to source more water. So even if they recycled all their produced water, it won't be enough. And we have places like the Permian Basin where you have too much water and you have to get rid of it. <coughs> Again, water that comes with the oil and gas. Um, and, and above all, you have very high salinity and, uh, and, and I, I think in your area is, is on average 100,000. Again, three times the concentration of seawater, which is a you know, very challenging uh, thing to, uh, to recover water or to clean this water. Uh, because it's it directly connects to uh, the energy demand for uh, doing it. And so the problem is the the challenges and limitation you know have to do with the fact that you know we we're, we're dealing in you know in the market and and money is important and um, and, and and all these oil and gas companies ask themselves many questions when it comes to treating water. Uh, again, because it's not the main, you know, uh, area or, or or important part of their of their business, their, the business of producing energy. And so the question that they might ask themselves, you know, is purchasing uh, fresh water less expensive than treating uh, wastewater? Uh, again, assuming that, you know, the water is available, um, should we dispose the water or treat it? Uh, you probably all know that disposal in deep wells is much cheaper than than treating this high salinity water. Uh, but in some places you cannot drill these wells, like in the 
you know, n- northeastern United States, and and that means that you need to to convey water long distances, which is also, um, you know, uh, energy. Um, economies of scale play a big role here. Uh, uh, we are, we are dealing with small systems, and these small systems um, usually they are more expensive to operate. You know, water is you know working very well with economy of scale. Uh, so that means that the treatment will be more expensive. The other question is, what is the maximum water recovery possible when you are treating or desalinating this type of water? Uh, can we um, recover as much as we want, you know, all the way to what's called zero liquid discharge? Uh, the oil and gas companies don't like it like many other entities, because when you do zero liquid discharge, you'll have to deal with the solids tracking the solid, disposing the solids. Uh, so you, you have to find the, 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 the middle ground of you know, how much water to recover. Uh, again, I, I mentioned the conveyance costs, you know, th- that can be depending on how far you have to get rid of the water or bring the water from, uh, that can be uh, expensive and disposal. Again, drilling a well, putting high pressure pump, Partially treating the water can be uh, also expensive. So potential solution, uh, and that's what we were doing in the last few years, is looking for uh, treatment, but with very short treatment trains. And if you can uh, treat water in in a small number of um, of uh, treatment processes, you probably uh, can reduce the cost and complexity of treatment. And so today I'll give you a few examples of research of developing short treatment trains, uh, both the successes, but also the, you know, some unintended consequences that uh, we need to think about when we develop uh, processes. Um, Here's a few uh, thoughts about, uh, you know, uh, treatment of produced water and, and desalination that I, you know, I like to people to start thinking about. Uh, when dealing with with treatment. So when we think about desalination, I think the best application today all over the world is seawater reverse osmosis. Uh, It's very efficient now. We figure out how to do it at low cost of, you know, less than four kilowatt hour per meter cube, uh, you know, to produce the water. It's really, uh, really, really cheap and very close to the thermodynamic limit of separation. So there's not much that you can do there, <laughs> and it's optimized for desalination of seawater, which is around three and a half percent salinity or salt. And we can achieve, because of limitation of reverse osmosis, close to 60 percent uh, recovery. So 60 percent of the water will become uh, uh, good drinking water. Uh, in California, this technology costs approximately one and a half dollar per meter cube. In Israel, in Australia, because of uh, you know the same technology, but because of different advances and and financial tricks, they managed to uh, to produce water for 50 cents per meter cube. Again, same technology, same same source water. Um, it is in a good place, in a good day, to dispose produced water it costs approximately 50 cents per barrel. Now, I'll, you know, for the engineer of, of you, I'll, I'll do this conversion that there are 6.3 barrels in a meter cube. And uh, that means that produced water treatment cost or, you know, is more than three and a half dollar per uh, per meter cube or or the disposal. It's not treatment, it's the disposal. So, you know, if you see the difference between disposing and, and that again, they're doing disposal because it's it's uh, it's the cheapest. You know, we are we have a very wide gap to close to bring treatment of produced water, desalination of produced water to level of seawater desalination. So, uh, so, so you know, it, it, is, um, it, it is a challenge that, uh, that needs a solution. So what's the requirement for water treatment for uh, reuse? Uh, we need to have, you know, treatment objective. You know, what do we want to use the water for? And we can use the water for um, you know, uh, internal use in the industry for fracking or for other uh, services. Uh, we can use it for irrigation, for uh, putting it back to the environment, 
uh, other industrial uses. So based on the end use or the reuse application, you will have to fit a different uh, train of processes. Uh, and when we are dealing with treatment processes, usually, usually we, are, we are approaching it through what we call multi-barrier approach. We put barrier to different contaminants, start with a large contaminant and slowly removing smaller and smaller contaminants. Uh, but in order to do it, uh, or in order to establish it, we, we have to have several steps. One of them is the pretreatment. Uh, and in pretreatment, we usually remove suspended solids, uh, small and large particles, and then we remove some organics, um, maybe in a separate phase, oil grease, but also dissolved constituents. And then we're trying to remove also uh, low solubility uh, salts uh, that will scale uh, in, in, uh, in harm surfaces. Once we are doing it, we can do different types of desalination to remove salts or small molecular weight organics. Uh, and, 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 and we can do it again, as I said, up to a certain target of recovery, uh, because beyond certain recovery, also the simple salts uh, can, can start precipitate or that their osmotic pressure will uh, limit um, their, uh, their, their further concentration. And at the end, we, we have to do a post-treatment and post-treatment can be uh, just polishing the water for the intended use, uh, but it also includes the, the brine management, disposal, um, and what to do with the, with the residuals from the processes. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll focus a lot on pre-treatment because that was the focus of our research in recent year. Um, because, you know, my, my approach was, you know, we we know desalination desalination is 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 you know easy relatively but you know a lot of the desalination processes are very uh, well established and optimized but uh, the pretreatment is also complicated and and remember the pretreatment is there to protect the desalination processes um, so again if we do good pretreatment we can actually use it for two things either for reuse in the basin for the oil and gas industry. Again, they require removal of some constituents if they use the water for fracking, for example. You don't want to compromise the formation with microorganisms or other constituents. Uh, so one option is for the in use uh, in the basin. Uh, another one is as a pretreatment pre for uh, desalination. Okay, what 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 processes we can uh, uh, use for pretreatment? We have different, you know, we we divide the treatment uh, unit processes into several groups, and uh, one of the first group uh, is the physical processes that include, you know, phase separation like uh, removing solid, uh, stripping of volatile organics or volatile compounds from water, uh, different different type of simple filtration. Uh, to remove smaller particles uh, or membrane processes uh, like osmosis or microfiltration, ultrafiltration processes. The other group is chemical processes, and in chemical processes, we are trying to further remove smaller particles like uh, with coagulation uh, to, to really remove small colloids, uh, doing absorption or oxidation to deal with organic uh, constituents, uh, disinfection to uh, uh, again help with oxidation or or to remove um, uh, microorganisms that are really uh, can can cause a lot of problem uh, if you're using uh, contaminated water with with microorganism uh, uh, for fracking. And the last one is biological processes, which uh, work very well for, uh, you know, for uh, domestic uh, municipal wastewater, uh, many other industries. We, we pretty much letting microorganisms do the work for us, mainly to remove uh, organic constituents and, uh, and nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, <coughs> but also sometimes for inorganic. <coughs> <clears throat> like arsenic and other things that you can remove with uh, biological processes. And we have uh, either the conventional activated sludge processes, but more advanced processes like membrane bioreactor or, or biologically active filters that I will 
uh, talk about uh, specifically today in my presentation. But there, there, there are some challenges when you talk about biological processes. Uh, one of them is that you know it, it's more sensitive process. We are dealing with microorganisms that like uh, uh, you know nice environments. So what's the impact of salinity, temperature, chemicals on the microorganism? Um, the impact of loading rates. You have to design the processes uh, to fit the amount of food that you give the microorganism. Uh, which is the waste that we want to uh, get rid of, and the number of microorganisms that's uh, in in your bioreactor, and uh, and then you know the changes in the characteristics of the biosolids over time, uh, who is there and what job that they do uh, to really achieve a, a target treatment. So some of these things I'll I'll talk about in the examples, and the example starts now. Uh, I I will go through a few uh, past and ongoing. Uh, project that we are involved in uh, for treatment of produced water. And uh, I'll again give you the examples of the solution and challenges uh, for each of these examples. Um, I'll start with the uh, decision support tools that we developed uh, and we keep developing. Uh, it's very interesting computer tool that just go from the water quality and quantity into um, we, we automated the tool to suggest treatment processes and then look at the beneficial use and the economic uh, of, uh, of using it. Uh, it's very nice. You know, we developed two uh, two versions of this tool. One, the first one was just for cold bed methane, but later on we extended it to shale gas and oil uh, and practically we included there 32 different treatment processes and 46 water quality parameters. And we, 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 we use very intelligent uh, process selection because the tools, we pretty much taught the tool, what's the performance capabilities of each process to remove different uh, constituents. And uh, I, I like this uh, you know, schematic or, 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 or uh, you know, picture here that uh, my student that developed the first tool put, uh, um, you know, you know, Ruby Cube have eight corners and 12 edges, and therefore there are three billion permutations or combination to achieve the goal. Uh, and now think, you know, when you have 32 treatment processes and 46 water quality, you have, you know, millions of billions or trillions of, of permutations. Many of them make no sense. And so uh, it was it was very nice to develop this tool that um, you know, uh, we did many things to verify that this is something that maybe the industry uh, will use. Um, again, those of you who are interested in, uh, in in playing with these tools, I'll you know feel free to send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you both the publications and a copy of the tool to uh, to play with. Uh, I'll talk later today about the new um, Naui desalination hub that we started with the funding from DOE that will continue to develop uh, this and, and similar tools in the near future. The first process that I want to talk about is, is uh, osmotic, uh, you know, osmotic treatment or pretreatment of produced water. Um, you know, we, you know, I think all of us know what how osmosis work. You put brine on one side of a membrane and feed on the other side. And the, you know the difference uh, is you know the, the, the diffusion of water will stop when the hydrostatic pressure equals to the uh, osmotic pressure and, and the pi is di disappeared here. Uh, so that works nicely, but it's not sustainable. So uh, people develop uh, what's called osmotic uh, or engineered osmosis or forward osmosis, in which we are uh, pulling water into a draw solution all the time. There's no pressure involved. It's just the difference in osmotic pressure here. And then the diluted uh, draw solution is reconcentrated with a um, reverse osmosis or distillation. Uh, and uh, and we are producing uh, clean water from uh, from here. So practically any drop of water from contaminated water and the feed water can be produced water or any other wastewater. Every droplet of water crosses two tight barriers here to produce very clean water. And so we extensively studied this uh, process to uh, to treat different types of stream, including produced water. And so the last big project that we had funded by DOE, we built 
um, a, a nice pilot system uh, that has uh, reverse osmosis here on the left and uh, forward osmosis on the right. And you can see the flow diagram here. Um, uh, both processes operated uh, in, in tandem to, to take produced water and concentrate it and, and produce uh, really high uh, clean water uh, with no additional pretreatment. So practically you see two steps uh, taking produced water into forward osmosis. Uh, again, the claim for many years is forward osmosis have low fouling propensity uh, and therefore uh, we can uh, um, treat the water to, uh, to high quality. But uh, after several months of operation with these membranes, we, we open the membranes, we, we, we call it uh, membrane autopsy. And what you can see here, um, you know, this arrow just show the flow of the draw solution inside the envelope here, that uh, without pretreatment, we accumulated a lot of uh, organics and, and, and black stuff uh, from oil and uh, from, from, from the oil on the membrane, uh, which I think the first conclusion was, yes, it's nice to do it, without additional pretreatment, but another uh, simple pretreatment ahead of it might might uh, help this process. Uh, I won't go too much into this diagrams, but we we, we look at the calcium um, uh, and magnesium transport through the membrane over time uh, in the for osmosis feed in the draw solution in the reverse of osmosis permeate. So from the feed all the way to the product water. And uh, we see that, you know, it increases. I think the, the bottom line from here, uh, we use these tests to just test the integrity of the membrane because if it rejects calcium and magnesium well, uh, you know, below a certain level, we know that the membrane is, is intact and, and it's in good shape. We looked at the dissolved organic carbon concentration again in the forward osmosis feed in the blue symbols and in the reverse osmosis feed. So after you know uh, going through the membrane, and uh, these are really low concentration initially. We have some stage that uh, you know the rejection was not so good, but going forward the rejection was really uh, really good for total organic uh, carbon. So so we were happy that that was removed. And we also looked at uh, different hydrocarbons uh, in the for the osmosis, uh, looking at the for the osmosis removal and the combined system removal. And that was in phase one of the study and then phase two. And you can see that for most of these compounds, we see above 90, above 95, you know, even 99% uh, rejection. Some, some others we, we saw lower, but uh, for almost all of them, uh, either no detection or very high rejection of these compounds. The thing that surprised us with this uh, process, you know, that everything looks very good, is these three compounds that you see here. And when initially we uh, got the results from our uh, gas chromatography and liquid chromatography, we say, you know, what exactly are these compounds? And it took us time to search in the literature and you see some of them are over time, just the concentration increasing here. Uh, this uh, uh, Ergofast uh, was relatively well rejected, but the others you know, started uh, appearing in the, uh, in the uh, RO permeate. And uh, eventually we found out that these are uh, common compounds that are used in the manufacturing of the membrane which told us that there is a chance that uh, the uh, hydrocarbons in the produced water, the residual, the low concentrations, they interacting with the polymer uh, material of the membranes and slowly leaching uh, materials from the membrane, which the conclusions here were, um, you know, uh, not surprising. Polymers likes to, uh, or hydrocarbons like to interact with hydrocarbons. Um, there's a chance that the uh, residual uh, hydrocarbons from the produced water uh, degrading the membranes, which eventually will degrade the performance of the process. So I think the main conclusion was, you know, be careful, watch it, but also that we need to maybe develop more, um, uh, more uh, sustainable membranes, more robust membranes, and maybe uh, to add, uh, you know, additional pretreatment uh, to the process. 
The next um, example of short treatment brain is something that we are still studying, uh, and this biologically active filtration of produced water. Practically, we take columns, we fill them with, with um, uh, uh, activated carbon, granular activated carbon, and we allow microorganisms to grow on it. So as water percolates through these columns, uh, the water gets through, uh, through treatment, the microorganism, um, uh, 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 just slowly uh, degrade, and, and we are depending on microorganisms that come with the produced water, so they are used to these um, 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 uh, compounds. We follow this process with a short, a small step of ultrafiltration to remove any particles from here, and from here to nanofiltration or reverse osmosis, and we tested different uh, configuration of nanofiltration. And we built a small, nice uh, system. Uh, initially, there was four columns. Now we are running it with nine columns with different media. And so we uh, we focus because we are uh, in the Denver area and we have close to us the Denver Julesburg uh, Basin. We are bringing water from there that have uh, a total dissolved solid concentration of around 15,000 milligram per liter. Again, lower than other places, but still. Uh, a lot of water to treat, uh, small batches, and we started inoculating the column. And so you can see here on the side that in the first week, uh, it took us, uh, you know, many hours, uh, more than uh, two days uh, to, um, uh, to, to remove substantial amount of dissolved organic carbon from the water. But as the time progressed, we saw better and better performance, and we could remove 90% of the organics within 24 hours. Uh, I think the unique characteristics that you see here is that uh, we have a sharp absorption at the beginning and slow degradation, and we know that this is biological degradation because of different control tests that we, uh, we, uh, we conducted. For the nanofiltration, we tested two configurations, the conventional now, uh, one in the uh, closed circuit desalination. I will not go uh, into too many details, but the nice thing about the closed circuit desalination is that you can operate at higher fluxes, higher water recovery, lower fouling and scaling. Uh, you need less membranes compared to the conventional, uh, and you have even distribution of flux across all the membranes compared to the uh, conventional. Uh, this is a, 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 a very extensive table of, uh, of major constituents in the raw produced water. You see this says TDS of around 15,000 and uh, DOC of around 400. And uh, as we go through the processes and we tested nanofiltration at different pressures, uh, and the color code just, it's a, it's a general color code for, you know, red is high and green is low concentration. And what you can see that in the DOC, we, we moved from 300, uh, you know, close to 400 to almost single digit uh, uh, milligram per liter of, uh, of uh, DOC in the water. And same thing for DOC, for TOC, we, we got to pretty much drinkable uh, level. Uh, when we look at uh, the um, uh, permeate flux of the membrane under conventional conditions, uh, again, as you increase the pressure, you have higher uh, throughput through the membranes. Uh, we conducted uh, cleaning uh, and uh, introduction of a new batch. And overall, you don't see, you see some degradation of the performance after 60 hours, but, uh, but not so uh, bad. Uh, and when you look at the um, uh, other constituents in the permeate, uh, dissolved organic carbon, total nitrogen, uh, TDS. Again, this is the feed uh, concentration, and you can see that we reached to very, very low level in the permeate uh, using the uh, nanofiltration process. Uh, here are results for the uh, three different membranes in the uh, closed circuit desalination mode. I think what we learned from here is that for specific membranes, we see better performance, uh, less uh, decline in uh, in flux and uh, actually we, we operated in constant flux and therefore you see uh, increase uh, in pressure for every batch that we operate uh, but overall uh, the performance and you can see the water quality coming out of it uh, 
pretty uh, 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 um, good performance and um, and 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 uh, as good as uh, or or even better than uh, the conventional nanofiltration operation. Uh, we looked at uh, rejection of uh, of organics, different organics, and we we found out that some of it are rejected very well. Uh, some have low rejection. Again, you can see here we're still in the 90s. Uh, here, so high rejection, and we didn't find these these uh, black diamonds are are the molecular weight of these these compounds, and we didn't find that there is any um, correlation between molecular weight and and rejection of these compounds. Uh, but uh, again, li like with the other, you know, are there any uh, unintended consequences to biological processes? Um, one of the interesting uh, thing uh, in produced water that have high concentration of uh, of halog halogens, uh, for sure chloride, but also fluoride and and iodide, and uh, we were fearing that uh, when uh, we are doing some of these processes, that iodide and bromide uh, and chloride might interact with the um, uh, methane and, and produce. Uh, um, iodobromo chloromethanes. Uh, and so I, you know, I had a student that was very passionate about it and we started looking into it. And uh, um, we were surprised, somewhat surprised, to see that, uh, and these are the nine columns that we are uh, testing and that's the influence. And what we discovered that slowly we are developing low concentration, uh, and it's not low, it's in the microgram per liter of uh, chloroiodomethane and diiodomethane and triiodomethane. And those of you are, are familiar with the, with the uh, fun fundamentals of in environmental engineering, uh, the iodomethane and the bromomethanes are more carcinogenic than the uh, chloromethanes, um, chloroform and others. Uh, so that was a, a source of concern. Again, low concentration, but still uh, something that you need to uh, to take into consideration. Uh, more surprising was that you know after storing samples for three months in the refrigerator, we also uh, saw a, a formation of new uh, 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 compounds like the chlorodiodomethane. Uh, uh, again, we, we're still looking into it and trying to figure out what's the reason for these things to continue to happen. Uh, we, we, we did some um, uh, analysis and we, uh, biological analysis, uh, uh, and we of course found that there were a small group of uh, iodide oxidizing bacteria uh, in the bioreactors that uh, most likely were uh, um, uh, the the uh, uh, they caused the, the formation of these compounds. Uh, another process that we're still running is is, is membrane bioreactor uh, with produced water. Again, a short treatment plant, uh, a treatment process, membrane bioreactor followed by uh, desalination. We are starting the desalination process now. But uh, but there are many advantages to a membrane bioreactor, and some of them are are listed here. Uh, we are operating with a membrane that has it's an ultrafiltration membrane that has 0 0.03 micron uh, pore size, so we are rejecting bacteria and, and viruses, and uh, so it's um, you know it's it's really uh, a, a nice process. But uh, again, we are treating uh, produced water from the DJ basin uh, that has between 15 and, and, and 30, depending on the batch that we're bringing in, uh, 1,000 milligram per liter uh, uh, salinity. Uh, but we uh, really want to target uh, water like uh, the water that you have in your area, so that process can be implemented uh, in high salinity basins. So um, there's a lot of data here, but what, what we were doing in the last year is that we slowly, and you can see it in the red, red line, we slowly increase the salinity of our produced water, uh, starting at around uh, 20, uh, 25, 30 uh, grams per liter or, or 1,000 milligram per liter. And we are now operating for a very long time at 100,000 milligram per liter, 100 grams per liter salinity. 
What you see here that every time that we're bringing a, a new batch, you know, different concentration of uh, of feed uh, um, total uh, dissolved or dissolved organic carbon. Uh, but uh, the unique thing is that regardless of the concentration and the concentration of the feed going down because we're not refrigerating and, and we have degradation of the organics inside the feed tank, but regardless of what we're feeding, you can see that the permeate coming out is very, very low concentration, um, uh, below 20, uh, it's around 14, 15 milligram per liter consistently, a milligram per liter of uh, DOC, and the water is, is crystal clear and ready for desalination with, uh, uh, we are going to treat it with membrane distillation. So uh, really uh, interesting process. We are working also with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, Joint Genome Institute on figuring out who are the microorganisms that do this job under very tense uh, uh, conditions. And, and again, uh, this is just results from uh, the different microorganism groups. Uh, this is the point, this is the early days of the experiments. Uh, for two months, we inoculated it with just um, domestic wastewater. And you can see as we introduce produce water, you can see just based on the color, the, the type of microorganisms start shifting here. Uh, these yellow ones starts becoming much more pronounced. Some others are just disappearing. Um, and so, so I think there's an, an, an interesting story there that we'll have when we'll have all the results. Uh, one of the last things that I want to talk about is analytics. And, uh, you know, many of you probably know that it's very expensive to perform some of the uh, analytics on these uh, water sample. Uh, some analysis can cost, you know, hundreds of dollars per sample in commercial lab. And so some of the thought that we have is can we analyze water in a cheaper way? And we took an approach of looking at uh, something that's called 3D fluorescence uh, in conjunction with a, 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 a software that's called Parafac to try to uh, interpret the, uh, the, the results that we get with, uh, with 3D um, uh, fluorescence. Uh, in order to do it, we, we, we piggybacked on this biologically active filtration with ultrafiltration uh, process and we took samples and we analyze both, you know, to, to calibrate it, we analyze it with uh, with uh, with uh, gas chromatograph, liquid chromatograph and other analysis to calibrate it. And so we looked at the different constituents or different groups of, uh, uh, of organics in these uh, samples, the humix, the low molecular weight neutral, uh, acids, building blocks, uh, biopolymers, and we also looked at the dissolved organic carbon uh, in these uh, water. Again, this is the produced water, the UF permeate, and then the nanofiltration permeate. And as expected, you know, they get uh, lower concentration of dissolved organic carbon. But you can see that the, the, you know, within the concentration of the dissolved organic carbon, the distribution of these different group is, is, is slightly different. Uh, and again, it's not surprising that in NF permeate, you'll see a higher fraction of low molecular weight neutrals that are more, e more easily permeating or are more poorly rejected by nanofiltration and reverse osmosis membranes. So this is how uh, uh, 3D fluorescence uh, um, um, results look like. You are exciting the sample, the water sample with different wavelengths and you're measuring the emissions and depending on where you get these fingerprints, you know that uh, uh, you have different groups of uh, organics. And so what we did, we took and we identified five groups that some of them are very uh, unique to uh, oil and gas and we uh, try to generate their fingerprint with 3D fluorescence. And, uh, and again, we, we use uh, uh, um, uh, uh, samples uh, you know, with real concentration and we, 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 we build the model to identify, uh, uh, and they identify these, uh, these groups. And what we were able to do is to generate these chromatograph, chromatograms uh, for each of these five groups of uh, fulvic acid, tryptophan, you know, humic, naphthalins, and 
and free uh, uh, tyrosines in, uh, in, in uh, practically just putting uh, a sample in the 3D fluorescence, we were able with this conversion of the uh, level of the emission to predict what will be the removal of these different groups in the bio in the bioreactor, the biologically active filter, ultrafiltration and nanofiltration. Again, uh, putting a sample in this 3D fluorescence cost us hardly five dollars compared to these samples that if you send them out, uh, can cost you more than five hundred dollars uh, each sample. So I think that there is an interesting uh, way to reduce cost of analysis and, and quickly uh, determine what's in, in the water. Uh, again, I'll, I'll uh, wrapping up my presentation. We are uh, doing other studies related to oil and gas uh, produced water research, uh, like irrigation with uh, treated and diluted produced water, uh, wetland treatment, uh, selective removal with electrodialysis. In a lot of uh, interesting studies that uh, that are trying to promote the recovery of uh, of water from um, uh, from produced water. Some concluding remarks. Uh, I think that oil and gas wastewater is complex streams, uh, and if we know how to treat it, we'll be able to treat many other complex and, and difficult to treat industrial wastewater. And um, and and we uh, again, there are too many industries that have. A problem with water. It's not only people, but uh, if we can help different industry, we we help downstream processes uh, and downstream uh, economies, uh, uh, and that's very important. Um, I think how clean is clean is 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 always a problem that environmental engineers are dealing with. Uh, for some compounds, we, we we don't know how much low we need to uh, to be. There are new approaches to looking at uh, treating different streams. Uh, we started looking at the toxicity level uh, of compounds that uh, take into consideration everything that in the sample, not only individual uh, constituents, the way that EPA looks at it. Um, again, it's actually work that we're doing together with the EPA to, to uh, find, you know, and, and the industry is really looking for guidance from uh, from EPA and from other organizations, you know, to what level they need to treat the water uh, in order to discharge or, or, or use the water for other uh, applications. Um, sustainability of process and, and detection of system failure before they become a risk and uh, adversely impact people in the environment. They are very uh, interesting topics. Uh, this is another Thing that I can talk about for an hour. One of the uh, area of research that we are doing now is data science in uh, water and wastewater treatment, uh, looking at the data that the systems are generating and trying to either forecast the performance or detects or early detection of failure of system, which can bring to two things. One is uh, we all talk about machine learning and how to uh, make autonomous systems and that's very applicable for remote operation like in the oil and gas industry, mining industry, and reducing labor uh, and, uh, you know, which will lead to reduced cost of treatment. Again, the economy of scale of water treatment, uh, one of the big component, especially for a small system, is the labor. Uh, if you pay one operator for treatment of small amount of water, the, the load of the of the labor on the cost of water is, is pretty significant. So if we can teach system to correct themselves and we need low maintenance, uh, that can reduce again the cost of water. I want to uh, 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 just introduce you in two slides to a new project that we have, and I talked a little bit about it with the uh, Professor uh, Nanu, because uh, I think that he, you know that University of Texas at West Basin can play a big role, is a new funding opportunity from DOE that uh, we are part of. Uh, it's called NAWI, the National Alliance for Water Innovation. Uh, it just started uh, looking at um, reducing the cost and energy demand and increasing the sustainability of desalination. Um, you can see here it's it's managed by four national labs and many universities, uh, many universities in Texas, uh, in Colorado, in California, in the in the East Coast. 
in uh, in and many many industry partners. Uh, this is a 100 million dollar over five years uh, enterprise that I think that uh, University of Texas in the uh, uh, Permian Basin can play a, a, an important role there. Um, again, it's it's five years, 100 million dollar low TRL. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the concept of technology readiness level, uh, so it's early stage research. Uh, there are four area of the topic areas, uh, material R&D, process innovation R&D, modeling simulation and integrated data and analysis. Um, in the first year now, we are focusing on a roadmap. Uh, we have a few projects that will start soon, um, really small amount, but the main uh, goal of the road mapping is to identify the research gap in major areas of uh, water uh, in the municipal sector, in the industrial sector, in resource extraction, so it's oil and gas and mining, in the agricultural sector, sector and in the power industry, uh, power plants and, 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 and the like. And then from year two to five, there will be RFPs internally that will fund collaborative research between the members of, of uh, NAWI. I think that uh, now we promised uh, the 20 percent of the funding will be uh, allocated to non members. So um, so again, I, I wouldn't uh, see a reason why other uh, new partners will not be part of it. Uh, under the process innovation R&D, which you know, uh, one of my main interests uh, and, and by the way, I'm 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 participating in the roadmap for the industrial wastewater and for the uh, resource extraction, specifically produced water. Uh, for the process innovation R&D, there are uh, six areas of focus that uh, have the acronym of A prime: uh, autonomous system, precision separation, resilient systems, and uh, and transport, uh, intensification of of processes, uh, modular systems and electrified treatment processes. So I think in each of them uh, there's interesting things to improve water treatment uh, systems and processes and project that will be uh, submitted and proposed that have the component of as many of these components there uh, have higher uh, chance to, uh, to, to be funded. And with that, I want to acknowledge um, you know, the industry and the funding agency that uh, that uh, supported the, uh, this research that I presented today. And of course, my research group that, uh, of course, <laughs> do all of the work uh, and, and other faculty and staff at School of Mines and, and other universities. And uh, and with that, I will uh, I thank you for uh, for your attention and I will be more than happy to uh, take uh, questions. Thank you so much, Professor Kat. Uh, great presentation. You know, um, I think Sarah, you have a lot of uh, you have questions, right? Yes, Sarah? I do have questions. Okay. Okay, Dr. Kat. So the first question is, how do you manage the retented from the membranes? Uh, so again, for for the research, you know, we are uh, <laughs> giving it back. Uh, but uh, you know, for future operation, this is a major issue for the industry. And uh, I personally, and the industry also, I don't think that we have any escape from uh, deep well injection. It will continue to be a, a solution for the brine. Um, and again, at the end of the again, many people are against it. I think that if you have sound engineering, if you build the wells correctly and you prevent, you know, any problem with the well casing or the connection between the well casing and the uh, and the different uh, uh, layers in the in the subsurface, uh, at the end of the day, you're sending water to where it came from, it, and it's coming from a very dirty place. And it's going back to a dirty place. Uh, so as long as you're not har harming uh, any aquifers, uh, I think that's that's legitimate. The problem is it costs money. You know, it's it's energy. It's pumping energy, but uh, 
but I don't see any other solution. Other solution means that we'll have to solidify it and put it in landfills. I don't think that that's a good solution. OK, the next question is, what is the efficiency or water recovery rate for the membrane? Uh, oh, that's uh, that's an interesting question because I, I presented several uh, membrane processes. Um, you know, I, I think depending on the on the processes and the salinity, uh, that, that's what dictates the, the recovery. Uh, in in pressure driven processes, if we're do, dealing with uh, nanofiltration or from re reverse osmosis, uh, you know you you cannot go much above 60 grams per liter. So depending where you start, you can get to between 50 and 70 um, percent, 50 to 70 percent uh, recovery uh, with membrane distillation that we are studying. And I didn't show my much results here. Uh, you can get to much higher than that, but again, your recovery will stop at the point where you start seeing scaling of uh, of low solubility salts on the membrane. Um, with ultrafiltration, um, we uh, we can have very high because it's all about rejecting solids, so we can see in the uh, ninety percent and above. Uh, recovery specifically for the nanofiltration that we tested with the uh, um, uh, produced water in the uh, uh, in, in Colorado. Uh, I think it was close to 70 percent, 70 percent recovery. OK, so the next question is um, for the membrane autopsy. Did you find any consistencies more present than others? Um, no, it was, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's the, uh, uh, you, you saw the, um, you know, the, the black deposit on the, on the membrane. Uh, we had everything there, uh, from the, uh, oil and grease and, uh, and different types of organics, um, and, and, and scaling. Um, we did not see much defects on the membrane that we were expected, you know, expecting to see, uh, despite the degradation of, you know, the, the fact that we saw different uh, uh, different constituents, unique constituents there. Um, but I think the unique thing, and in, in what I showed there, the picture that I showed that was, uh, you know, from the autopsy, you know, before the autopsy of the four of the smallest membrane. The reverse osmosis membrane that was downstream then from the Ford osmosis looked like new, sort of it was well protected by the Ford osmosis membrane. So, so at least one thing was you know achieved well there. Okay, and then we have a follow-up question for that. Um, did you analyze the materials in the membranes? Again, can you repeat it, please? Uh, yes, it's a follow up question to the membrane autopsy. Did you analyze the material in the membrane? Um, yes, yeah, so you, you, we, we did analyze both, you know, the membrane and the material that deposited on the membranes. In the membrane, again, these are tight, you know, very, very uh, uh, tight membranes. They are non porous membranes. So, Things don't go into the membrane; they just deposit on the membrane. But um, but again, we we saw the different um, the, the same constituents on the membrane um, that uh, that's that's in the deposit. Um, again, we published a paper on this. Uh, I think that I I had on the slide the uh, the reference, but um, but uh, if I remember correctly, there there's information in the uh, in the paper that, pub that we published on on this work. OK, the next question says, does the decision support tool take into consideration energy consumption and cost of treatment? Absolutely. Um, so. So just a, a few things and on the development of these tools. Um, first, we looked at, you know, what constituents we want to uh, deal with. Then uh, in the core and the heart of the process of the model, that's the uh, the treatment selection module, which is the smartest part of it. What we did, we selected processes that we want to include. 
and we created what's called, um, you know, expert ranking uh, matrix in the computer. Pretty much for each process, where you know each process is a column, and the rows there is the capability of the process to remove the different constituents. So reverse osmosis for sodium, 95%. Again, we try to shoot for the right numbers there. And then for the different processes, we created what we called cost curves. Cost curves for um, the capital cost of systems based on the size uh, and the capacity that they need to treat and the recovery that they are supposed to have, cost curve for chemical, cost care for labor and cost care for uh, energy. And when you introduce, the user introduces uh, the, the capacity or you know, the size of the systems and the water quality and the computer select the processes, it pulls this information from the cost curve and eventually tell you um, how much you know, energy it will cost, how much chemicals it will cost, how much labor, and everything is accumulated eventually in the economic or beneficial use economic uh, module of the tool, the fourth one, where you add the cost of infrastructure, piping, in, in interest rate, a lot of the things the consultant engineering firms are doing to give you a bottom line. So for this size, it will cost you X dollar per barrel of water to treat. So yeah, it takes into consideration all of the both technical and economical uh, aspect of the process. OK, the next question is slide 21 and 31. What are the analytical tools you have used to measure the construction, um, the concentrations of organic compounds? What slides you say, uh, 30? 21 and 31. 21 here. So this is a, a, um, a GCMS, gas chromatograph with the mass spectroscopy, and 31 is, uh, this was also gas chromatography. Most of these compounds, they are iodinated methanes, they are volatile, uh, and therefore uh, we develop uh, methods on our gas chromatography um, uh, machines to, uh, to analyze. Again, this was published, and so the method is described in the in the paper that we publish on this uh, uh, iodinated brominated compounds and uh, the same thing here that's also was published so i uh, if i remember correctly the methods are also described here we, we also had another paper specifically on the method development for all of these so um you know the, 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 this information can be found on on, on two separate papers OK, the next question is for biofiltration. Have you tried the produced water that has H2S? Um, we we have not specifically looked at H2S. You know, the water that we bring is water that goes through uh, gravity separation in the field and we take the water from the gun barrel tanks. Uh, so there is what what's what what's there is. You know, we are not uh, trying to manipulate anything. The only thing that we do in some of the processes, um, specifically for biologically active filter, we are oxidizing the water a little bit. That's why you also see that there's some degradation of organics in the feed water over time. Uh, we oxidize to remove iron and manganese because we uh, we, we we notice over the years that uh, iron manganese as they go through these columns they deposit on the granular activated carbon and coat them and therefore we're losing the porosity that we really need for the microorganism to uh, attach to the media. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, again, just by just based on the smell, there's not much hydrogen sulfur left in the water when we get it. OK, next question. Can you talk a little more on the application of data science and for forecasting and detection? Is this related to the constituents or volume of water? Do we have two hours or not? <laughs> 
Okay, you know, so on campus, we have a 7,000 gallons per day membrane bioreactor system that's running for 12 years now and treating student wastewater. Uh, 7,000 gallons of student wastewater every day. You can imagine that that's a very interesting wastewater, uh, especially when, you know, we have interesting analytical tool to measure what's in the water. But, you know, this is another story. Um, what we started looking at data science a few years ago when we have an, an event that the pH of the water went down over a few days and the salinity went up and eventually, you know, some of the sensitive microorganisms died. And we looked back and I say, you know, you know, with microorganisms, you don't know how to predict that something will happen. And, you know, I wonder, you know, is there anything in the data that we could have predicted that something goes wrong? Because the only thing we had to do is to come there and throw a few kilos of lime or, or, or soda ash to the water to bring back the pH up. And uh, I started working with statisticians and I gave the statistician a batch of data of 10 days and I told them, listen, here's the data six days before the event and four days after. Tell me if there's something in the data that could have told me that something's going wrong. And they develop a nice statistical model and based on uh, principal component analysis that they later on advanced into um, um, dynamic uh, 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 principal component analysis. Uh, and um, so it's more adaptive dynamic principal component analysis. And they discovered that two days, 48 hours ahead of the alarm that we got that the pH is, is too low, they were already signed in the system. They, they couldn't say what because the, you know, the computer didn't know what data it's, you know, but the, what the computer look is that the, the computer learned what is normal operating condition and looking for something that's going abnormal. And, and that's how the computer raised the flag and said two days ahead of this event, there were already signs that something is going wrong. And that started a very beautiful collaboration on looking at early detection and and, uh, and, and, and looking at um, um, monitoring systems uh, through these methods. Uh, that uh, extended uh, last year to, and that's a, that's a very nice collaboration with Baylor University where the statisticians are, and, uh, and we are doing the wastewater side and, and validation. Uh, we had a very successful, another project last year with a wastewater treatment plant where they operated in a very unique um, way of controlling their activated sludge system and the aeration there. Instead of measuring dissolved oxygen, they, they measure dissolved ammonia to control their air blowers. And their air blowers go up and down and up and down. It's not healthy for the air blower and it's not healthy for energy demand. And we started working with them using similar tools to do forecasting of what will be the ammonia concentration in the middle of the basin and what we were able to um, to achieve is that we were able to predict in very high precision what will be the concentration there 50 minutes five zero ahead of the water getting there which which allows you to adjust the blowers ahead of time as the water is flowing towards uh, that point uh, that was successful project for two reasons why one is that the facility, the water treatment utility, agreed to incorporate it into their process, into their SCADA system. So they trust my students. My students know a little bit programming, and um, again, it's it's not it's 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 a big you know wastewater treatment plant that operates and and restricted by regulation. Uh, they allow us to intervene in their SCADA system and to implement it. Uh, and another, uh, and again, a, a testament to the fact that it was a successful. My student won a, a very nice prize in uh, WEFTEC in the uh, 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 lift competition. That's a competition that looks at data science in, in, in water and wastewater. Uh, she won the first place last year. Uh, so, so again, forecasting. And then my colleagues at Baylor, um, we just published a paper on now the computer detecting a, a failure uh now isolating and and, let, and now bringing the computer to tell you what is exactly is the failure or what contributes to the failure i think that's another 
a unique thing. And again, the future for that, again, the machine learning, the early detection, the self-correction of the system. I don't need an operator there. You know, if something goes wrong, maybe the system can correct itself. Uh, it's a fascinating area if you have the data. Uh, again, I, I tell people that the data have gold and diamonds. We just have to start pulling them out. Um, but I think that's the next uh, thing in, in water treatment, wastewater treatment. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> OK, the next question is the membranes you are testing were manufactured by the school or purchased from outside? No, we are. Uh, we are not there. Uh, you know, there, there are some groups of developing membrane, but all the membranes that we're using are from uh, from the industry. OK, the next question is, can you comment on applications of temperature difference driven processes like membrane distillation and water treatment? We have another two hours. <laughs> I think that memory distillation, you know, half of my dissertation was on memory distillation. I, I'm still fascinated by this process. I think it's a it's very interesting process because you're using smart materials to achieve uh, evaporation through, uh, through membranes. It has multiple applications. You can evaporate water, but you can also strip out volatile and recover volatile compounds, including ammonia, including other things. Um, it operates at low temperatures, uh, which, you know, you can do distillation at low temperature with pretty high flux. You can treat very high salinity water that there's no chance that you can treat with uh, reverse osmosis or nanofiltration. But here are the problem with membrane distillation. Um, first, we're using commercial membranes that were not developed for membrane distillation. They were developed for something else. So, they're not optimized, so you know, th there still need to be optimization of um, of the pore, you know, porosity, the pore size, the pore size distribution, uh, things like that. Uh, the other problem with these membranes is, you know, they have to be hydrophobic in order to repel the water, uh, which means two things. First, um, you need to do a good pretreatment to remove hydrophobic compounds like oil, grease, alcohols, uh, soaps from from water. Otherwise, um, they will just um, flood the pore. You know, put water in the pore, and the process depends on the pore being dry and only vapors diffuse through there. Uh, so, so first you have to have unique materials that are very hydrophobic. Uh, the second thing is that you need uh, to uh, maintain this hydrophobicity. And the problem that, you know, if you start fouling them a little bit, then the surface starts changing and you might slowly lose the hydrophobicity. So either to develop materials that are, you know, that maintain hydrophobic or that they can go through a treatment to restore their hydrophobicity, I think that's important. And I think the last problem with this process, like with many other um, thermal processes, is, is uh, energy management or heat management. So as the water goes through the system, you have heat loss in two ways. One is convective transport with the vapor. So as the vapor crosses, it takes the latent heat of evaporation with it. This is a good heat transport. You know, you want evaporation and therefore uh, but you have also conducted heat loss. So your, your heat just conducting through the membrane, that's a bad thing that you want to minimize. Um, and now how you do it within the membrane is not simple. And uh, again, those, you know, if, if we have, I don't know how many mechanical engineers we have in the audience, but you know, mechanical engineers know it that, you know, the, the real distillation processes that we are familiar with, the, um, the uh, uh, vapor compression distillation and multi-effect distillation, they they depend on multi-effects, on multi-stages to each stage recover and, and utilize some heat from the previous stage. We don't have it well in memory distillation yet. Uh, there was one company that com commercialized sort of multi-effect memory distillation, but, uh, but we are behind there. So, so that's another field that needs to be, uh, be improved. OK, the next question is, how are you oxidizing the produced water? 
In most cases, we just added a little bit of uh, potassium permanganate, uh, permanganate to the water. And that was enough to drop down the iron and uh, a little bit manganese. Uh, yeah, no, not more than that. Some people okay. use uh, per peroxide. You can use. Uh, we try to avoid using, uh, you know, chlorine. Uh, so again, for us, peroxide was um, uh, par permanganate was was good enough. Okay, um, in desal of high TDS water, what are your thoughts of what to do with salt removed? Again, again what's the, the beginning of the question was? In desal of high TDS water, what are your thoughts of what to do with the salt removed? Something, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, here, here's the deal. So I, I, it highly depends what else in the salt. Um, you know, DOE um, actually released lately several call for proposals on um, on recovery of uh, of high value materials from from brines. Um, you know, if you have some high value material that you can remove and um, and and it makes sense to try and you find a good process to uh, recover that's a great thing you know it will you know it will it will help you with the cost of the treatment uh other than that there's not much to do so it's again either to evaporate it and dry it to solids and send it to a landfill or to send it to where it came from and that's deeper injection uh, Again, when you when you look at the numbers, you know if you take uh, high salinity salts, let's say, let's say you know, produce water from the uh, Permian Basin, one hundred thousand milligram per liter. Think about it: one hundred thousand milligram per liter, one hundred grams per liter. That means that every ten liter, produce a kilo of of salt if you completely dry it. Now add the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of barrels per day you come up with mountains of salts where are you going to put them and you know how much money you are going to pay to track them away because now it's not like you know in the permian basin you know the big thing now is putting uh, pipelines and moving water with pipelines instead of, instead of trucks you know this is great you cannot move uh, salts in in uh, again maybe if you know if it's even if it's a very high concentration brine you know the viscosity can can start kicking you and and and, and clogging pipes and and what have you, but but uh, but starts moving salts is is difficult. And and again, where where will you put them? And then the wind will start blowing them away. And I I think yeah, the best way is to put them back in the ground. Okay, that is all the questions I have so far, and we have about ten minutes left. Professor Kat, you can tell by these questions that there is great deal of interest in your presentation. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, we had a good conversation earlier. I think, you know, all these students or people that ask this question, you have to transfer them into environmental engineering program. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we had, um, I think we have a number of people here from the industry. Uh, I think I saw something from Gerardo. Are you here? He's from H2O Mysteries. So when you were talking about the membrane autopsy, you know what you're finding on the surface. I think they had a similar experience with the uh, piping network, you know, for transport of water. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is uh, again even from transport of transporting water. You, you know, uh, you know, you, you'll benefit from pretreatment. And I think another another aspect of research that I think very important and uh, I'm sort of lucky to have been uh, a veteran of a, an ARPA-E project. Uh, ARPA-E is the Advanced Energy uh, Program uh, uh, at DOE that uh, pay for research on High risk, high reward um, uh, ways to de develop uh, energy. And one of the things that I really, it was tough, but the thing that I enjoy in this program is 
other than the fact that they come and check on you every three months, they have a site visit. They force you to do techno-economic analysis of the process that you are proposing very early in the game. And this is a very nice exercise for every, uh, you know, for everything and, and specifically for technology development. If you can do a good model of the technology plus the economics and early on say, this makes sense or doesn't make sense, is it just incremental improvement or quantum leap? Uh, I think that will help you. And you know, when, when people come to me and I think all of us in, in academia and also in industry, you know, we have all the time people come to us and say, you know, I invented this process and you know, this is going to solve all your problem. And you know, you know, wh when people come to me with this, I always say, you know, I was like, show me the techno-economic analysis. Show me you know, where the numbers are. And I think this is a great exercise for every graduate student to do a project, especially in technologies, to do a techno-economic analysis. And so again, when I talk to different oil and gas companies and ask them, you know, why don't you collect data correctly? You can save a lot of money if you just look, you know, in your data and find where are the, uh, you know, wh where are the mistakes or where are the, the inefficiencies? You you'll save money even if you'll pay another position of a statistician in your company. Or when I talk to companies and say, listen, here's there's a trade-off between pump pipes clogging versus the extra cost of pre-treating the water. You know, where, where is the optimal point here? And I think that that applies to uh, everything. You know, where, you know, uh, what's the trade-off between uh, to do something else to the water versus paying a lot of money to uh, maintain your infrastructure? So, um, yeah, water chemistry is, is one of these areas that um, we're dealing with. Uh, with complex solution that, uh, and I think, you know, you talk, you know, I, I, I talked to uh, many of these midstream companies and, and, and upstream companies now, I think that those that shut down many wells now, and I think the fear is, you know, once they'll, um, you know, open the wells and start flowing the wells again, you know, the things that will come out and the corrosion that will happen in the pipes, uh, that, that will be a major, uh, major problem for the industry. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. I was uh, surprised to see that uh, the cost of treatment uh, for diesel in California is one dollar and a half, and in Israel is 50 cents. What is okay. Israel doing? I know they have the best uh, water research in the world, but what are they doing that is different? Okay, so, so there's... <laughs> So there was a lot of, there was, listen, so first, you know, I think the way that they implemented it is amazing. I think 80%, 80% of the drinking water in Israel now is coming from the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, that diffuses a lot of, uh, you know, uh, geopolitical problems and other, you know, problems, but, but it's a good thing. I think two things, you know, again, the country saw it as a, as a major initiative that they have to do. So the government gave some subsidies there. So again, there was some, some uh, some criticism of the financial tools that have been used, but but again, I think you know it's uh, it's legitimate if it's a national priority and needs to be a national priority in the U.S. too. You know, if the government give you the land for free to build the the, the, the sanation plant, so be it. You know, yeah. it, eventually it will benefit people that will use the water because the water will be cheaper. Right. Um, the other thing that they implemented there. Um, is um, you know, you know, very smart energy recovery uh, uh, ways to produce water at very low cost. Again, the thing is that the same engineering company also designed the San Diego plan. So it's <laughs> not, you know, so it's this exact thing. The problem in the US in San Diego was that it was, it took forever. A lot of money went into legal fighting with environmental group uh, over the energy use over the discharge of brine back to the ocean, uh, things that in Israel, you know, was not an issue. And I think in many places in the world, especially in Australia, when Australia started to develop their desalination program, they demonstrated that the brine discharge to the ocean is, it's a drop in the ocean. You know, if you're, yeah. if you're spreading the brine well, 
there's no environmental impact. Maybe locally in a few meters around you, but very quickly it diffuses in, and, and there's no issue. Um, and that's that's the major cost in, and and the energy cost in uh, uh, in the in uh, in San Diego was also a factor in the higher cost. So. Uh, and, and again, economy of scale playing a very big role there. Um, it's a big plan, but uh, but still, uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting uh, outlier on the graph of economy of scale. I didn't show it, but uh, yeah. uh, it's it's unique. Okay. Well, <coughs> thank you. Are there any more questions uh, for Professor Cut? No, there have not been any more questions. Well, let us uh, virtually thank the speaker. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you, if uh, the audience have uh, uh, my contact information on the last slide. I'll I'll be happy to share the slides if, if somebody wants. Uh, so Sarah, if you want to, uh, I I can share with you a PDF of the slides. And if somebody wants, you uh, probably easier for them to contact you than me. Or if people have more questions, I'll always be happy to answer. Yeah, that that would be great. You know, yep. if you can share with Sarah. And, yep. uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Stay safe. Yeah, you too, guys. All right. Bye. Bye bye.